Yes, you are being recorded, so keep it clean, ladies. <laughs> and we'll explain the recording to you later. But first of all, I'm not going to have you sing the national anthem. Because I understand in church you can't sing, so if you can't sing in church, we can't sing at the Putnam. But we will say the pledge, so please say it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And we have our own Nora Mori Moriarty. And if you haven't been in the gift shop yet, you need to see how it's been rearranged. And there are still a few sale items. That's right. Yeah, 75% off. Ooh, can't beat that bargain, especially if you win one of the two gift cards today. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway, I will turn it over to North. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Kind of turn, or yeah, yeah if you want to turn, I just have some, you know, little photos and visuals that are going to be on screen. So if you want to turn this way. Um, there still are a couple unoccupied seats up here. So we are not going to come a little closer during the presentation. And should we try to cut some of the lights off to make the lecture spooky? And do you need the microphone? Ladies, Well, I guess it depends on whether or not y'all can hear me. Do you, need this, do you need this light to raise? Yeah, let's try to. Yeah, that one's a good one. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so does anyone want me to use a microphone? Can you hear me clearly, or am I a little too muffled for you? Speak up. <laughs> Sounds good? Okay, great. I have no problem projecting. That's one of my talents. All right, so as Gail introduced me, I am Nora Moriarty. I work here at the Putnam Museum. I am assistant manager of visitor services, and you will most often see me in the gift shop. So I've had the pleasure of working with Gail many a day, pre-COVID, in the museum store. And before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much to the Putnam Guild. We so appreciate all the work you do and the support that you provide to us. So thank you. All right, so today we're going to be covering some local creepy stories and ghost stories, as well as some lesser known Putnam Museum specific paranormal activity. So we're going to start with the locals and bring it a little bit closer to home. Got a lot of stories to cover. Gil, you might want to help me keep time. <laughs> As I've been kind of stuck right along. <laughs> All right. So, make sure this is awake. There we go. So, well known story Colonel Davenport, widely considered to be one of the founding fathers of our area, along with Antoine Leclerc, some say his best friend. And Colonel Davenport, as many of us already know, had a very tragic end. But do we know all the details of how he met his end? It was July 4th, and all of his family had gone to the Independence Day celebrations. Even the servants had left the house and been allowed to leave the house to go to the celebrations and enjoy themselves. Colonel Davenport, leading up to this day in 1845, had decided that he probably had a little too much money in his house. He was well known to be the wealthiest citizen in the area. He was well known amongst everyone, even the non-local people, people who came through had heard all about the glorious Davenport mansion and the vast riches and treasures that were inside. It said that Colonel Davenport even had premonitions of being attacked and robbed in his own house. And fortunately, that all came true on Independence Day, 1845. Around 1 p.m. in the afternoon, he heard a noise in the next room. Going to investigate, he found three men crawling through his window in broad daylight. He tried to lunge to fight them off, but one of them, possibly John Long, shot him in the thigh. He began to bleed, it's in an enormous amount of pain. These men bound him and blindfolded him and dragged him to his bedroom where they knew the safe would be. They couldn't get the safe open, so they had to force him to kneel with an injured leg in front of the safe to open it up for them. One of the grisly details of this that I used to say during ghost story tours is that he would kneel in a pool of his own blood. But then we started getting kids interested in ghost stories and I had to start cutting that out. <laughs> now we did get the safe open and inside they did 
did not find what they were looking for. They found only a little bit of money, not very valuable, nothing like what they were expecting. They were doing a daylight robbery, and they had just shot a well-respected man. They needed to make it worth it. So they rebound him, re-blindfolded him, threw him on the bed, and tortured him. They waterboarded him using a picture of his own water. They beat him. And then debated over whether or not they should set the house on fire with him still alive inside. At this point, one of the younger robbers, Aaron Long, John Long's younger brother, said, hey, let's just, let's just get out of here. We're running out of time. People are going to be back soon, and I feel sorry for this poor guy. Let's get out of here. At that point, they agreed, okay, let's just leave. So Colonel Davenport lay suffering in his house, crying out for help, and luckily a passerby heard him. He came just in time to be able to help Colonel Davenport keep him alive for a little bit longer, long enough for Colonel Davenport to tell his story, give enough details to be able to identify his attackers. And then he succumbed to his injuries that night around dusk. Now, since Colonel Davenport was such a well-respected and beloved member of society in the QC area, the hunt for his attackers was relentless. In fact, it was a bounty hunter hired by the local lawman that was able to find them. He found six men that he believed were the robbers. And of those six men, three men were sentenced to hang until dead. Of those three men, among them were John Long, the man who we think fired the shot, and Aaron Long, his younger brother. On the gallows, it said that John Long begged and pleaded for an hour straight, begging for mercy for his younger brother, telling everyone it wasn't their fault, society did this to them, like, it's just, please, dear God, don't hurt my younger brother. To no avail. People were bloodthirsty. They wanted justice for Colonel Davenport. They hung the three men. But here's the thing. Aaron Long, the merciful younger brother, his rope broke and he fell, still alive. At that time, the custom was to consider this an act of God. This is God showing his mercy. This is God showing that he, it's justice has been served. Let him go. Let, you know, just pardon him. Be on his way. But the crowd, as I said, wanted blood. So the crowd fighted and shouted and turned into a mob very quickly. And fearing that it was going to get out of hand, the lawmen decided, just untie a little bit more of that rope, the rope that broke, and rehang Aaron Long. Oh. <laughs> just get it over with. And in vain. And so poor Aaron Long, begging and crying, was hung until then. It's been reported that people have seen silhouettes in the shadows around the Colonel Danforth house. People seeming to circle, look in the windows, going around the perimeter of the house, maybe trying to find a way in. Could this be the spirits of the robbers trying to undo their wrongs? Perhaps it's John Long trying to save his younger brother, prevent it all from happening again and again and again. What's to say? <laughs> of course, as we know, the Davenport House is not the only spooky site on Arsenal Island. <laughs> it was established as a government site in 1816, and it was actually Lincoln himself who signed the deed to say that this would become a national arsenal. During the Civil War, Nearly 2,000 Confederate soldiers were in the POW camp on Arsenal Island. Conditions were not good for them. The Arsenal actually earned the title the Andersonville of the North. And for those of you not familiar with that, Andersonville was actually considered the worst and most brutal Southern POW camp to be in. And this is what they compared it to for the Union. The Confederate soldiers that came here had not been home in months, maybe years, could be injured and sick and came here far from home in unfamiliar territory as prisoners. In just the first four months of the POW camp being open, 950 soldiers died under their guardianship. They died from exposure, dysentery, pneumonia, even smallpox. Many of them who came to this camp would never go home again. And now a cemetery is all that remains. Witnesses have reported seeing 
what seems to be the shapes of Confederate soldiers wandering in the mist. And they claim to hear the echoes of taps being played long, long after dark. Many of these soldiers, as I said, had died from wounds, from illness. They came here not in the peak of health. And many left in a pine box, if at all. Now, Quarters One is interesting. It was built in the 1870s, and it was actually built with iron cast from the cannons and bayonets that had been used in war. Who knows if some of those weapons have been used against the Confederate soldiers. Now this building, some say, were, was built and opened under bad tidings. The first ever event they even hosted in this building was a funeral. It was a funeral for Brigadier General Thomas Rodman. And ever since then, People have reported numerous ghost sightings, unexplainable sounds, unexplainable activity inside that building. It just doesn't seem to be a very good place to be. <laughs> People often see Confederate ghosts also crossing in front of the entrance of Quarters One as if marching back and forth. There's a room inside this building that Charles Lindbergh himself stayed in back in 1927. And that room has had negative energy ever since. It's not surprising, it's Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> But people have reported things that wouldn't really be easily explained. They see, say that they've seen faces peering out of the windows, but they've also seen faces peering in from outside on a second floor story, or a second story window. 